This product review has been made with the kind permission of the folks on Patreon. Yeah, that's all I got. Remember that time when I said I was doing a content shift? This isn't that. This is something separate. I would have done this anyway, so if you think, oh my god, this blows, uh, then don't worry, you won't be this format for too long. So why do I have to do this? Well, a few months ago, Anthrodesk asked me to review a motorized sit-stand desk, and in return, they let me keep the desk. My initial response was, wow, why? Anyone who knows this channel knows that I don't review tech products, Obi's furniture, or the in-between of the two. So in this case, it seems kind of weird that I'd review a desk on a channel specifically devoted to looking at media. Now, the generally decent thing to do is just to be upfront and say, well, I don't think I'm really a good fit for it, fit, fit for it, fit for it, which I did, but somewhat half-heartedly because I really want to sit soon desk. <laughs> and while I say I don't do tech products or furniture, discussing furniture as a means to discuss something else isn't that crazy in the scheme of things. Edmonds and Hussero talks about writing desk and Zizek talks about modern furniture as a form of torture. A Spanish art historian uncovered the first use of modern art as a deliberate form of torture. Oh, go the device. Uh, all right. Kadinsky and Klee, as well as Gunel and Dali, were the inspiration behind a series of secret cells and torture centers built in Barcelona in 1938, the work of a French anarchist. Now, I'm not as clever as them, but I wanted to say, well, you know, there's precedence. So, all right, floodgates are open. So let's do this. Let's fulfill my end of the bargain. Let's review a sit-stand desk as a piece of media. Just can't make things simple. There's going to be two kinds of people who generally come to these videos. The first are people who type in Anthrodesk and think, all right, what does this idiot have to say about it? And the second are people who generally more familiar with my content are going to come in and say, all right, what does this weasel have to say about it? For the former, let's get through the brass tacks. Does it do what it advertises? Yes, it does. It goes up, it goes down, there's a pleasant industrial noise that's not too loud, and it's quite smooth. The table seems to be a sort of board with a waterproof paint finish. Wow, it just comes right out. It seems quite sturdy, it's heavy as shit. And it's like, okay, but that's generally what you're going to get at this price point. It seems to fulfill the weight it advertises, and I'm currently running two gaming monitors on a pretty hefty Vivo mount because high refresh rate smartphones have ruined my ability to interface with content. I love Arc Knights. Sometimes I'll minutely adjust the desk height in small decimals because I feel like I'm missing out on the right height, but realistically in post, it just makes me look like I'm going insane. There's a Bluetooth app which doesn't register my inputs and five programmable settings, but I only use two. Sit and stand. Wow. So does it work? Yes, it does. Does it help with my overall workflow? Well, when it comes to office ergonomics and to a lesser extent weightlifting, I have an X-Men style superpower. I'm short. This was my former desk. It's a cheap elevated dining table that I got for 70 bucks, and this is my current chair. It's a drafting chair that I got for the garbage. The problem is that the height adjustability of this desk could be helpful for specific peoples, but for me, the helpfulness is relatively limited. But that limitedness is not necessarily because of any particular fault of the desk, insofar as a desk can have faults, but insofar as the person that I am, who's already hacked together solutions to my issues, will have relatively limited utility from the existence of the sit-stand desk. And that's really interesting, right? Any honest evaluation of this desk has to account for what is effectively a history that comes with me into this desk, a history that extends beyond the desk as an object out there, but nevertheless plays a sharp role in defining what the desk is in the process of evaluating it. So you might think, oh, you know, that's okay, Joe, I'm gonna go to another reviewer who's not a man lit and see what they say about the stand desk. 
I don't have problems with the height requirements at Canada's Wonderland. And that's like, okay, that's fine. That's a good practice in general. But there's a little bit of a problem. If you look at reviews of this desk, you're going to see that they're not all the same. Jean-Denis Haas here, for example, has a completely different board than mine. Tech Dweeb has a completely different control panel. And so does Kefren and Andre and I crack your device. Oh my God, 1.2 million subs. So if you're a prospective buyer and you're thinking, okay, I need a sit stand desk and I like the way that your desk looks or your control panel looks, then it's kind of a crapshoot because it can seem like we're all reviewing AnthroDesk desks, but they're all very different AnthroDesk desks. And for someone who wants to drop money on a desk, this can be something worth considering. And this can, in a way, affect how you relate to a desk because, well, we gotta talk about objects. We oftentimes think about objects and how we relate to them, but when it comes to actually speaking about that relationship, there's a lesser discussed element of self-reflexivity that comes with it. All these desks are desks, but they might not be the exact same desk you get. The click of the button might not have the right feel. The board might not have the same texture. It might not fit your room the right way. All of these are predicated on the object as a series of relationships that we oftentimes ignore for the sake of any practical discussion of the device as something to be sold. And this is something that's important to remember. This desk is affordable, but it's not cheap. It fits in a lot of spaces, but it's not compact. It brings a lot of conveniences, but that increases points of failure. This isn't to say that there's an issue in reviewing or that these reviewers are insufficient. What I am saying is that the parameters for mindful reviews are a lot more varied than we might think. And part of that is based on the relationship between us and the technologies we employ. You ever heard of the phrase, the medium is the message? Once upon a time, there was a town, a town where chaos reigned. Lawlessness was everywhere, and there was no cohesive theory existing which properly explained the mass media and their impact on society and man's thinking. And then one day, a stranger came riding into town, and all the townsfolk gathered round and asked him his name. Well, he tipped his hat, and they said, Marshall. Marshall McLuhan. Marshall. It's a turn of phrase that is often employed to mean stuff like the way you say something informs the thing you're talking about, and direction and destination are often interlinked, etc, etc, and that's like fine, but oftentimes missing out of that statement is exactly what McLuhan often uses as a critical case. Sure, there's talks about television and radio and cinema, but what starts off understanding media? It's electric light. Okay, let's stop here. I realize that in the process of making this video, it's probably not a great idea to do an explainer McLuhan in two paragraphs because I'm gonna get situations like people saying, well, the content of a media is always another media. Explain that, internet man. And then I'm stuck in this awkward zone where people who trust me are like, yeah, I think that's right. And then the people who aren't are like, pretentious. The main thing I want to stress is that this desk, by virtue of how it operates, interlocks with a whole bunch of things that play quite a critical role in terms of how we grapple with an object. For example, if this cable is too short, then the desk doesn't work. This desk can only be connected to an electric outlet, so I need to extend it if it doesn't, and if I just run it without, then I don't get the motorized height adjustment, upon which it just becomes a regular desk. And then you ask why you should be paying motorized sit-stand prices for non-motorized crank rotation action. Something like a motorized desk, a thing to be plugged in to be a motorized desk, is ironically an object that draws attention to its nature as an object while simultaneously trying to hide itself. Better posture, ergonomic economic workflow, something that fits your specific needs, as long as it's within four or so feet. Redirect yourself in relation to an outlet to be more productive. But that electrical connection tries to hide itself. This is really fascinating because tables aren't meant to be things that exist within the conscious process of whatever it is we're doing. For me, real objects are there, definite, more or less familiar, agreeing with what is actually perceived without being themselves perceived, or even intuitively present. I can let my attention wander from the writing table I have just seen and observed, through the unseen portions of the room behind my back, to the veranda, into the garden, 
to the children in the summer house, and so forth. To all the objects concerning which I precisely know that they are there, and yonder in my immediate co-perceived surroundings. A knowledge which has nothing of conceptual thinking in it, and first changes into clear intuiting with the bestowing of attention. And even then, only partially. And for the most part, very imperfectly. You guys ever see that movie Interstellar? Man, Matthew McConaughey is greasy as fuck in that movie. Like, every scene he's drenched in sweat. That motherfucker needs to invest in some towels, not the fucking space farm technology. We don't think about the table, about. but the table plays a role in setting up the way in which we relate to a space in a specific context. It's why sitting at certain tables in certain settings generates a specific kind of mood. That table, in that way, in that setting, is appropriate, but appropriateness is also related to assumptions of who we are. It informs a set of directions. What is it appropriate for? To eat, to study, to work. We have a conception of a certain kind of social configuration, which is hidden in familiar actions, undergirding natural assumptions about how we relate to objects and the spaces in which they exist. Some people can't sit at tables in public settings and get work done. Others can only get work done in such settings. Mariyama. <laughs> the reason is because experiences are perspectivalist in nature. To experience a thing, a table, a show, is to experience it from a perspective. Mind a particular vantage point. By nature of that perspective, others are less seen, under discussed, out of focus, out of sight. To look at a table is not to look at a table, but to look at a table from a specific point. Look at it this way. Suppose you're a stay-at-home parent and your kid's calling you. You get up to attend to them, you're dragged from the table. In this case, the table's ability to account for the social position as caretaker is kinda insufficient. It doesn't make you more productive because your kid is already taking precedence. On the other hand, it can enable a more productive process because you might already be standing up because you aren't constantly getting up and down. For someone like me who doesn't have children, the idea of productivity by long bouts of uninterrupted sessions can be more applicable. In other words, evaluating an object isn't just about the object itself, but also in which lines of relationships inform the conclusions we have about these objects. And sometimes alternative lines can be deeply hidden, surfacing only when things don't necessarily fit. This is something you can see eloquently discussed in Sarah Ahmed's Queer Phenomenology, where they discuss tables very appropriately in a certain sense, specifically tables in a certain way. We can think, in other words, of the background not simply in terms of what is around what we face as the dimly perceived, but as produced by acts of relegation. Some things are relegated to the background in order to sustain a certain direction. In other words, in order to keep attention on what is faced. If phenomenology is to attend to the background, it might do so by giving an account of the conditions of emergence for something which would not necessarily be available in how that thing presents itself to consciousness. The reason why is because our relationship to the world around us, or consciousness, doesn't just exist in a way, but in a way, in a space. And space demands directions, orientations, a grappling with physicality. The objects don't just exist for us to control, but they come in with expectations on their existences, situated in ways with expectations which we peer at. This is important because when we talk about reviewing something, it's not just a discussion of the thing, but whether we like or hate it, what forms the bedrock of why we like or hate it, what sort of vantage points exist which shape the statement of how we like or hate it. The desk is ultimately something that hasn't changed my life that much, but the reason why it hasn't changed my life that much is because I've already had extremely poor solutions, so the transition isn't as noticeable. But for someone who doesn't, who is interested in it, who might have never had a motorized sit-stand desk, this is a very good, very nice, and affordable option. Or perhaps it isn't. Maybe the board isn't what you want, the length isn't what you hoped, the weight isn't what you liked. It could be all of these things, and in the process of me talking about how good it is as an affordable option, none of that matters that much if this matter, this thing, this physical thing, elicits a specific interpretation of your experience with it. And that's not even to discuss things like presence and tactility. 
I like watching a lot of Linus Tech Tips and they got a channel called Short Circuit. It's shorter product reviews that lets them fulfill that sort of feel good dopamine consumerism machine that clicks in our brain when we watch unboxing and review videos. In one of the videos, they talk about the Logitech's MX keys, which I have and I like. But the feature they discussed the least and arguably the feature I think is the most important is Logitech's macro system. It's extremely easy to set up and has nearly replaced most of the auto hockey functions for me. The reviewer, Ploof, doesn't talk about it. Where's the emoji button? F6. Emojis, oh my God, okay. In fact, so most worked. tech YouTubers don't talk about the Amex keys the way I use it. But here's the thing. It doesn't mean that they use the keyboard in a way that's wrong just because it doesn't fulfill the way I'm using it. Instead, it means that the way in which they relate to and come into this keyboard review is so critically different that the review is not just an evaluation of a product, but an orientation of the person evaluating the product. Simultaneously, my experience of the product, just as my experience of the desk, is bracketed by assumptions about a particular workflow of which the reviewer is generally not privy to. Yet, reviewers often have to take for granted the naturalness of their evaluation process. They can't cover every base, so they must assume the nature of the reviewed product is natural. But I also think trying to understand what is natural or deemed natural in the process of your experiences can help shed light in ways in which a specific thing is shaped and in turn partly shapes you. Well, as a kid. But it says a lot that my entire memory of the movie was just the airport. We often take for granted the verisimilitude of something presented in media, but we often don't think too much about what underlines or makes that seem true. This can extend into more generalized media contents like TV shows, what is true, right, wrong, realistic, compelling. They're all upheld by assumptions which make these things seem as such. When we encounter something, whether it's a table or a text or a conversation or anything that inhabits a space, recalls a sensation, begs a question, our perception is a negotiation between intentions, a fluctuating flow that even the object being perceived becomes itself recollective, unfocused, with sections unseen and must be presumed as such to complete the circuitry of interpretation we have to make conclusions about even our own perspective. I think? I don't know, it's a DAS. I mean, like, what the heck can I say about it? It goes up, it goes down, like, what can I say about it? I don't know, I don't know. God, Anthrodes is gonna hate this.